On Tuesday, Leax published a report for the first quarter of 2023, and standing beside me is none other than Tony Nickel, CEO. Welcome back. Great to be back, Michael. Mm -hmm. How would you summarize the quarter before we go into the report? Well, I think uh, obviously you've had a chance to, to, to look at the numbers, and um, you know the headline commentary was, uh, you know, a, a return to pretty solid volumes and uh, and a more profitable quarter for us. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have to say that you know the the, the report uh, the result was was quite in line with our expectations, uh, but it's you know it, it it's great to see uh, you know to see a good steady order board and the underlying profit uh, return to the business. Precisely, the uh, title was increased volume and improved profitability, and it reported a revenue for this quarter that amounted to 588.6 million sec. And if we compare that to Q1 2022, uh, it was 436.8. Uh, you reported an EBIT of 19.8 positive. Uh, could you tell us what what drove the increase in uh, in um, in the uh, in the, in the sales? Yeah, well, uh, just both sales and, and profitability, Michael. Um, on, on the revenue side, you see new business that we've been winning starting to flow through. Uh, you see a much more stable supply chain situation. Uh, you know, I've talked a lot about that in the past as a, as a real challenge for our business. Um, so that uh, steady order board, new business, um, and some inflation uh, is coming through the numbers, uh, you know, clearly as, as prices rise and, and we start to pass that on, uh, it, it's definitely reflected in the top line. Uh, but in the bottom line, uh, really, it's coming down to a stable order board, mm. uh, less, um, uh, you know, disruption in our facilities, uh, good, uh, good absorption uh, at a high volume level, and uh, immediately you start to see the result improve. Mm. Indeed, you, you, you talk about this in the report as well, specifically the inflation that negotiations with clients have well gone as expected. Is there more clients to negotiate with now? I think it's an ongoing uh, you know, negotiation, uh, uh, again, as we've talked about in the past. Uh, you know, there's there there's a lot of uh, dynamics in in the industry. Um, there is a, still a fairly high level of inflation. Um, uh, clearly, this time of year in Sweden, uh, we're talking to our unions about about labor rates and uh, and and wage increases. Uh, so you know, it's it's kind of a constant uh, effort to be in front of the customers and, and and trying to state your case on 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 pricing and why pricing needs to go up. Um, but but you know it's a challenge. It's uh, you know they're 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 always trying to push back, and uh, you're always trying to justify, and uh, you know that's the dynamics of a of a supplier customer relationship. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about a little bit about the uh, the uh, delivery chains because you speak now that they have seemed to stabilize. And I'm curious, even though you 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 seem kind of uh, optimistic about uh, profitability ahead. Uh, do, do, when, when, when do you expect the delivery, delivery problems to settle for good? What, what's left? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, I think that um, what, we, what we're seeing in the market today is more of a, uh, of a uh, I'll use the analogy of grass fires, you know, that are, um, you know, popping up here and there in the, in the, within the global supply chain. Uh, it seems to have shifted a little bit more towards North America right now. They're seeming to have uh, some more challenges in, in supply chain in North America. Um, but what, what we have avoided, let's say in the last four or five months, is these forest fires that uh, uh, really kind of consume the global supply chains and, and you know, tend to have a trickle, trickle effect when, uh, you know, when, when one big part of the supply chain is broken, uh, it, it, it does tend to spill over into other uh, you know other other areas. Uh, you know it's a bit of a contagion effect, I mm -hmm. guess, and uh, uh, that has pretty much come to an end right now. Um, but uh, as much as I am optimistic, uh, I think I, uh, you know, I, I warn in the report, and uh, may, maybe the, the the subtext in the report is that um, you know we're not totally out of the woods. Um, you know we still have. Uh, you know, uh, what looks to be, you know, an extended conflict in Ukraine, uh, that situation is going to need to resolve itself before I think we can, 
you know, finally look and say, okay, well, at least in Europe, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of out of the woods on, on supply mm. chain. The increased demand that you write about in a report for commercial vehicles and industries, uh, would you say that it is, a, it is an effect of the supply chain issue sort of settling? Yeah, or is it something yeah, fine? I, I think so. I think, you know, um, you know I, I tried, you know, to use words not to, you know, to confuse the audience, but I, I think there's been underlying demand, uh, you know, freight maybe coming down a little bit, but, but um, you know, there has been underlying demand. I think there is, you know, clearly if, if, if you look at some of our customer reports, we talk about an aging fleet, uh, you know, the need for replacement vehicles in, in commercial vehicles for sure. Um, so I think the demand side has been, you know, has been there, it's been robust. Um, you know, the real challenge has been their ability to be, be able to produce vehicles. Uh, and then, you know, the spit off effect to companies like mine, who are trying to deal with a very uncertain build, uh, short term, you know, order cancellations, those kind of things. That situation really has righted itself. Mm. I believe Volvo said something similar in their report about uh, fleets needing to renew. How often does, does fleet feel that need? You know, I think it really depends on the mission profile, um, you know, of, of, of a particular fleet or a partic particular vehicle. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of rule of thumb is, you know, 1.5 million kilometers and, and you know, a, a long haul vehicle is ready to be to be replaced. But um, it's more just about the 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 um, average age of the fleet um, that that tends to give uh, companies like Volvo um, you know, the ability to say, you know, we see a replacement cycle uh, that, that, that w will continue. But it really is quite mission specific. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so construction off highway vehicles have a different lifetime uh, than something that's an on the road long haul vehicle. Mm -hmm. Would you say then that this demand for renewing uh, fleets comes uh, from uh, degrading vehicles rather than, uh, than uh, technical improvements? I think it's a combination of things, to be honest. Um, you know, uh, clearly, there is a total cost of ownership calculation that, again, that fleet owners uh, or, or, or even owner operators look at as new technology is introduced. Um, what's the payback on a new vehicle? Uh, you know, the, 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 you know, our customers um, and, and then our customers' customers are really trying to optimize fuel, for example, in, in, in today's uh, inflationary environment where fuel cost is obviously a big driver of the operating cost of a vehicle. So as our customers introduce new technology that brings a five or six or seven percent fuel reduction, owners start to look at those numbers and say, yeah, I can, I can afford uh, the capital investment in a new vehicle with a with a good payback. Mm. But if we if we look at this, then uh, increased demand from uh, from uh, those managing fleets, uh, stabilized uh, supply chain issues, uh, negotiations have gone well with with inflation and such. Would you say that uh, unprofitable quarters are behind you? I think you're looking for my forecast, Michael, and I'm not so sure uh, uh, about that. But you know. Um, you know, it's really for us. Um, you know, it's it's more one day at a time. Um, you know, there's so so. Yeah, I, I you know I would hope so. You know, and uh, hope is not a really strong word. Uh, uh, you know, for 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 markets and our customers. But you know, uh, there are signs that things are more stable. Uh, we are recovering some inflation. Those things all point in the right direction for us. Um, but but you know the world is um, you know you know a pretty uh, I don't know if unstable's the word but you know I think we we could be one crisis away from another mm. you know larger existential type crisis um, and you know there's a lot of people in media uh, in, in, including you know you know economists that are using the recession word now you know uh, that that that's kind of taken over the airwaves that we've got nothing else to talk about so to, so to speak so um i'm i'm just i'm cautiously optimistic if if you know that would uh, that would suffice on our forecast. Cautiously optimistic. We'll remember that one. Uh, but uh, I continue to read in the report, and I noticed that research and development was mentioned. What sort of efforts are you putting there? Uh, that's been a big, big uh, focus area for the company the last the last couple of years. Um, uh, certainly, 
um, as we look to diversify uh, the end markets that we serve, so beyond mobility and, and into general industry, into passenger cars, into rail, um, uh, you know, we have to develop the products and processes uh, enable to, to enable us to serve those customers. And uh, our research and development uh, activities have been really centered around um, developing processes that are the world's best, uh, you know, top of class, best in class. And so we have, uh, you know, a team of people that are really dedicated to refining our processes. And we're, um, you know, feeding that part of our business with the type of funding uh, to really try and accelerate our our growth in, in, in the other end markets, um, you know, specifically electrification, for example. Uh, we've invested heavily in the type of processes and people uh, to enable us to do that. Mm. And how close would you say the research and development department works with your clients? I think they're, you know, totally integrated. Mm. Uh, you know, for someone uh, like Leax, it's obviously, um, you know, where we're developing some of our own products, uh, but really we're focused on our customers' products and making our customer products better. Uh, without a super integration there, it doesn't happen. So that's been a big, uh, you know, kind of forward integration of our R&D people into our customers and creating that, that customer intimacy that allows that to happen. Mm. Tony Nichol, CEO of Leax, thank you very much for answering my questions. My pleasure, Michael.